I'm now going to moderate a discussion with three venture capitalists who are very active in this new space. Uh, incidentally, they are all uh, speak with conviction because they are investors in Gainsight. So please uh, come on up, all three of you, and I will introduce you as you, as you take the stage. Uh, the first uh, person taking the stage is Ajay Agarwal, who the, leads the West Coast office for Bain Capital Ventures. And my own magazine, Forbes, nearly 20 years ago, had Ajay and his colleagues at uh, uh, Trilogy, an Austin-based company, on the cover. They were all about 25 years old at the time, so it was the era of 25-year-old, seemingly overnight CEOs. Uh, Mark Andreessen took Netscape public in the same year, and congratulations. And by the way, all three of these venture capitalists are, are, not, um, are not paper venture capitalists. They're not people who went straight from an MBA program into venture capital. They're all really successful entrepreneurs themselves. Our second uh, in the middle is uh, Roger Lee, who's a general partner at Battery Ventures. And years ago, he was the co-founder of Corio, a managed service provider that was acquired by IBM. And then Harrison Miller was, is the managing director of Summit Partners. And uh, he's had a, a whole range of success, but including his time actually as an operating guy was at Amazon from 1998 to 2003 when he was the founding VP and GM of Platform Services, a $180 million unit of the company developing and deploying Amazon's technology infrastructure. So uh, welcome, all of you. Uh, tell, tell us, uh, we'll start with you, uh, Harrison, yeah. uh, and I'll ask this of all of you to begin with. Why is this such a promising field for you? Uh, so some invest in growth companies worldwide, about half in technology and about half in other sectors like healthcare services, financial services. Um, SaaS has been a big category for us over the years, dating the first innings of, of SaaS with companies like Right Now and WebEx and others. Um, but recurring revenue news businesses in general represent about $3 billion of revenue in our portfolio. And those are actually subscription-based agreements. There's a lot of companies in the remainder of the portfolio where we want to invest where it's a recur reoccurring revenue situation where the principles of customer success being driven here are um, very much to the core. So we view this as a SaaS movement, but a way beyond SaaS movement, and it's something that all of our companies can benefit from. Well, now you started out in venture capital, and then, then you uh, went to Amazon, correct, and then came yes, back? Sir. Yes. And what, I would be interested, what did you learn from Amazon during this incredible period from 1998 to 2003? Oh, do you have an hour? Um, I would say that, um, uh, so it, it's, uh, it was an amazing bu business to be a part of, working closely with Jeff. We were a, we were a bookstore when I, when I joined. I would say that, um, uh, like the people in this room, that company really walks the walk of customer centricity. And I also know that it's a heck of a lot easier said than done, and some days you just want to avoid a crisis. And so it's about how can you get on your toes um, and make sure you're getting ahead of all the different things along a chain that lead to the kind of happy customers that have been core to Amazon's business. There isn't an interview that Jeff Bezos does where he doesn't use the word customer, I think, in every, right. e every sentence. Yes, and it's from the heart. Um, but, uh, but there's a difference between uh, consumer customers and B2B customers. And so at, at Amazon, dealing with largely consumers, or were you dealing with, with enterprises? I created a business within the company that was uh, architecturally and business-wise a predecessor at AWS. I can't get credit for AWS. We deployed our technology stack on behalf of big retailers that were struggling to get online themselves. We were able to make five and 10-year agreements. We had to keep these folks very, very happy, um, but we didn't have the annual renewal challenge that now is the core. And that's just an example of what's happening across the industry. We used to be able to sell stuff forever or in 10-year increments. And now it's by the month, by the quarter, by the year. Uh, Roger, uh, give us a little bit of the arc of your career from Corio to where you are today and why this, why this space excites you so much. Sure. Um, yeah, Cor Corio is actually relevant. Um, most people in the audience probably haven't heard of Corio, and I, I wouldn't blame you. Um, Corio really was a precursor to the SaaS movement. Back then, they were called ASPs, or application service providers, but the idea was similar. Uh, we started the company because we believed that all software should be delivered like water and electricity. It should be delivered, you know, through the internet uh, on a hosted and subscription basis, and so we would take applications from PeopleSoft and SAP and uh, Oracle and Siebel and lots of companies, some, some of which aren't, aren't around anymore, and deliver them out of our data center. But at the time, uh, software wasn't really designed to be hosted. And it wasn't really designed to be delivered in a multi-tenant way. 
Thankfully, you know, that shifted over the past 15 or so years. Salesforce was really the first, but then virtually every other software company has come in behind them adopting that same approach. And, and what that has really, you know, um, uh, been a, a, I don't know, example of is, is this broad trend in our economy from a transactional economy to a relationship economy. And so in the old days when you were licensing software from the Oracles or the SAPs of the world, you would give them $10 million, they would give you the software, and you're basically off on your own. And you had to go figure out how to make it work. And they would prefer you to be successful, but they weren't really economically incented to make you successful because they got their $10 million up front. It didn't really matter to them. Now, in the world of a, a relationship economy or a subscription economy, I'm only going to get 1% of that economic value on that first day, and then I'm going to get the remaining 99% over the next 5 years, 10 years, 15 years. So I'm highly incented as a software company to make sure you're successful. And so we saw that transition going on, not just in software, but in media, in retail, financial services, virtually every industry is going through this transition will, where if they can, they will deliver their product online in some digital form on a long-term renewal subscription basis to their customers. It shifts your mindset. You know, you went from an account management mindset where you kind of prayed the phone didn't ring and you didn't have to deal with a customer to a proactive customer success mindset. And once you take that leap, you, you have to rethink everything you're doing. You have to rethink the data you're tracking, the workflows, the activities you, you undertake to make those customers successful, to make sure you get that renewal every day, every month, you know, every year, hopefully for the full 100% of the, uh, the li lifetime value of that account. And so you know, if I tie it back to Corio, we saw the trend happening very, very early on, but it was very immature. Now it's, it's you know, a movement. And it, again, it's not just software. It's virtually every industry is adopting the same movement. And what, what makes it so exciting and what, um, you know, the reason why I think 900 people are here at this event is because it's touching so many of you. It's changing the way you work. It's changing the way your companies work. We have CEOs up here talking about the fact that this is a CEO level priority, a board level priority. And that's really exciting. And it's great to see it, it become um, such a core part of how, how these businesses are, are operating. Yeah, and I remember at the time, um, w what has since become known as cloud computing, IBM actually was calling utility computing, if I remember. Yeah, and, and there were a right. lot of companies out there trying to, trying to own the nomenclature. But Ajay, uh, describe the, sort of the arc of technology as you've seen it from, um, from uh, your founding of Trilogy and getting on the cover of Forbes at, in the mid-1990s to today. It would have gone from a, uh, a lot of people forget that the fundamental difference of I Internet 1.0 and Internet 2.0 in subsequent times has really been just incredible bandwidth that has allowed service organizations to do the things that they just couldn't do. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I joined Trilogy in 1994, and. Uh, you know, it was founded by a classmate of mine uh, from college, and he was 25, and uh, I joined, and he said, let me, you know, took me out to lunch, he said, let me tell you about enterprise software, and I, I knew nothing about the enterprise software business, and he said, there's one important lesson that I want to share with you today, and he said, customer success does not matter, <laughs> and I was sitting here, you know, newly minted MBA, spent two years, you know, learning about delight your customers, make your customers happy. That's the key to building a long-term sustainable business. And I said to him, that's crazy. How, that's, that can't be possible. And he said, who's the largest enterprise software company in the world? I said, SAP. He said, if you talk to any of their customers, no one's happy. <laughs> Oracle, <laughs> no one's happy. He said, these companies spend all their energy on selling and growing their market share and you know, eventually it gets deployed, and then the customer's stuck, and they'll pay maintenance forever. And so, which is why customer for life had a much different had connotation. A much, that's what I figured you were referring to uh, earlier. And so, that was my original lesson. And what was interesting is, you know, the trilogy business grew incredibly rapidly at that time. We went from zero to three hundred million dollars, and then in two thousand, the music stopped, and people stopped writing ten million dollar checks for enterprise software. And so, we realized the only way we're going to keep growing is to sell into our install base. Um, and so Joe, the founder and CEO, said, let's take our top 100 accounts, we're going to divide them up, and the first thing we're going to do is interview each one and ask them one simple question. Are you successful? Based on why you bought Trilogy and the money you spent, just a yes, no, binary answer, are you successful? We're going to collect all that data, and the ones who say yes, we're going to go sell more software to. 
So we, uh, we spent you know, a good portion of 2000 and 2001 doing this. And unfortunately, the number that said yes out of 100 was 17. Um, and needless to say, we didn't sell much software in 2001 or 2002. And you know, I think it was a really interesting lesson for me um, about the fact that in some ways what I learned in business school was exactly right. It's not sustainable. Uh, and it wasn't sustainable for Trilogy. And you know, all the things that Harrison and Roger mentioned about you know, the change in not just the software business, but in every business to this notion of a relationship, you know, I think that wave is evidenced by everyone here today is, is here to stay. I think what I think one of the biggest drivers, frankly, is, is, is it is it here to stay, or is it just uh, our, there's often this temptation in business yes. for for uh, fads to come in, and not just fads in the consumer sector, which are pretty obvious, but fads as thinking styles go in in management philosophies and techniques and so forth. So convince me that this isn't just a transitory thing that makes us all feel good about customers. Well, I think the thing that's changed, it, frankly, is social media. Because I remember back in those mid-90s, our customers at Trilogy, the ones who were on the 83% that were unhappy, they didn't talk to each other. You know, it, it was amazing how we could have an experience at one customer, and this other customer, we could be in a brand new sales cycle, and they would ask us for references. We'd trot out the same three references you know, to all of our accounts. And no one talked to each other. And today, in this world, you know, everyone's here physically. But when you guys go back to your offices, you're going to be on social media. You're going to be on LinkedIn. You're going to use all these forums to connect with your peers and find out, hey, you just bought that piece of software. You just signed up a relationship with that vendor. Are you happy? Is it successful? So I think the information is now out there. Um, and it's prevalent. I, tag on, I, yeah. I, I totally agree. And, and Jeff Bezos early you know, was one of the first guys saying, every happy customer tells two people, every unhappy tells 10. And that was before Facebook. But I would go further than yeah. that. It's, and, and it's not that this revolution is not going backwards. It's not based on the good intentions of people, although people do have good intentions. It's that customers now have a taste in all these industries of a subscription renewable relationship. And of course, they want it because it keeps us all honest. It keeps us on our toes and performing. And so once that floodgate is open, people don't want to buy with rare exceptions. They don't want to buy certain products anymore where they're stuck with it forever. So the customer's taking over, and it's about economic incentives, which are very, very powerful, as we should get into, in terms of the economic benefit of, of being great at what, these, what, what we all do. Well, let's talk about the, uh, why this should be <coughs> addressed at the board level. Now, you're all on uh, multiple boards yourselves. And um, I'll just read like, briefly a conversation I had with Fred Smith, the founder and CEO of FedEx, for my book. And uh, we were talking about board governance. And Fred says, you know, one of the tragedies of American companies, uh, board governance, is that 80% of the time is spent on audit committee issues. And that's because there's personal liability there. There are SEC regulations, so on and so forth. And he said all the really important things about an organization, strategy, customers, customer happiness, uh, tend to get relegated to the end of the day and therefore uh, don't get the attention that they deserve. Yeah. So when, you, when you're calling, I think quite rightly so, to have this be discussed at the highest levels of the organization and embedding it into the ongoing strategy of a company, you're absolutely right, number one, but you're going against some awfully powerful currents, number two. How do you win I, this argument? Well, I, um, the way I put it, the, the ultimate responsibility of, of the board members, their fiduciary, uh, are their fiduciary responsibilities for the shareholders and to try and optimize shareholder value. And, and there's a lot of evidence out there that, that clearly correlates, you know, high levels of customer success, high levels of renewal with the highest multiples and the greatest, you know, equity value for a company. And I, I, I shared a similar example last year. We, we had a, a similar discussion at the Pulse conference last year. And, and, and just to put it in very stark terms, you could look at two identical companies. They both have 20 million of revenue. They're both growing at 50% per year. And there's one difference between the two. One of them has 5% annual revenue churn, and the other one has 15% annual revenue churn. If you fast forward those two companies five years later, the one with 5% annual revenue churn has 90 million of revenue. The one with 15% annual revenue churn has 60 million of revenue. So the compounding effect of that churn over five years eliminated 50% of the revenue, 90 million versus 60 million. And as bad as that sounds, 
if you then look at what would those companies be traded at in the private or the public markets, apply a you know, 5x revenue multiple, the one with a lower churn is worth uh, $450 million, the one with a higher churn is worth $300 million. There's a $150 million delta between those two simply because they paid attention and they were focused on churn. So if that doesn't get the attention of the CEOs and the board, I, I don't know what will. Well, and it's, and also, it's also reputational, isn't it? I mean, uh, everybody talks about the importance of trust. Berkshire Hathaway just had this annual meeting in Omaha a couple of weeks ago, and Warren Buffett said basically what our success has come down to you know, over these last 40 years is trust. People trust us. And when you, uh, to the degree you have churn, you also create distrust in the marketplace. Isn't that true? I yeah. think that's part of it. And I, and I think that you know, you've got to have, for, for this to really work, to improve in this area, you need religious leadership at the top. You need a conviction at the top. But it doesn't just happen. And we don't want to be sitting here saying, oh, it's what happened. The boardrooms of America are all about customer success now. It does get back to these numbers. I'll share some more data with you. As I mentioned, our SaaS, I'll just do the SaaS companies. Our, our SaaS portfolio is of 800 million in revenues, 20 companies. The top quartile of them are at the 120% annual customer uh, dollar renewal rate and above. The bottom quartile, it's about 96% and below with the lowest mean, meaning 90. In a lot of boardrooms, if you're not really plugged in this, you got, folks look at 95% customer, that looks pretty good. But by the same math that you're talking about, Roger, and you know, we, we sort of start with a $100 million company, 30 million in ACV a year, two companies. The difference between 95 and 120 is the difference between a, a public company that's worth a couple billion dollars and a $160 million company that trades for 3X if you can sell it to somebody. So it's a big economic incentive. I think part of what folks in this room have to do is to help to quantify that for folks. So not only in our board meetings with our companies, not only do we make sure that we're tracking customer dollar retention and have goals for it, but I ask folks, okay, can we quantify, please, and all agree among us, what would two points do? What would be the economic benefit of two points if we could sustain it over the next five years? And when people start looking at those numbers, they start going, oh man, like I gotta get everybody in a room and talk about this, not just my customer success department. And Anjay, when, when should companies start thinking about this? If they're startups, um, how, how soon should they start making this a uh, priority? If you're a startup, priority number one is raw survival, <laughs> and you know, which you have to have cash, and all, we all know that, any of us who ever worked in such a company, but what, at what point is this, should this become a real focus of the CEO? Well, let me ask an, a question for the audience to, to get to your question, Rich, which is how many, I think we have companies of all sizes here. We have Fortune 500 companies, we have startups. How many people in this room, does, you, it, does your organization use some kind of CRM, Salesforce automation system? I, I would assume it's 90%, if not 100%. And if you, if you go back to the boardrooms 20 years ago, uh, if I think about our boardroom at Trilogy in, in the mid-90s, the concepts that we take for granted today of forward visibility, of seeing the pipeline, of looking at all the opportunities at different stages and knowing what we're going to hit in a particular quarter, none of that existed. You know, before Salesforce automation, in a boardroom, you'd simply say to the board, we hit our numbers or we didn't hit our numbers. It was always backward looking. I think as you think about customer success today, yeah. oftentimes today in the boardroom, it's backward looking. We lost two important customers. We had more churn than we were hoping for. We didn't have as much upsells uh, in the quarter that, than, than we were hoping for. And so I think yeah. what this conference is all about and what this movement is all about is just like we've seen this transformation in the Salesforce automation world where now we all take it for granted, it's a standard, but it's all about forward visibility so that you can do something about it. That's what customer success is about. You want to know ahead of time what is the health of your customers, what's working, what products are they buying, where can you upsell ahead of time. If you know ahead of time, then you can make change and you can affect the outcome. That's what it's all about. And I think that's why, I think that's the shift that we're yeah. starting to see inside the board. Yeah, it's okay. customer success isn't defense, it's offense, right? It's not hang on to what I got, we talk about retention. For the reasons we've just been talking about, it's an offensive strategy for one of your most profitable areas of growth. We survey our CEOs so we can you know, have conversations among them on their growth plans for the next couple of years. And this is not just SaaS CEOs, it's 90 CEOs of companies around the world. And you know, we, offer, we offered on the last one a list of 12 strategies for growth and all the usual stuff, which you get trained on in business school, international expansion, buy a company, Salesforce expansion. The number three one was customer retention and upsell activities, which I thought was, I mean, it was a self-selecting group in that we're choosing forward-looking companies, but, but I thought that was very impressive, and people are getting it. It's offense, not defense.
Yeah, I, I encourage my CEOs to hire their customer success leadership in uh, very early on because, again, it, it does have to be part of your culture, you know, from the get-go. If you're not committed to the success of your five or ten customers, you won't get to 100 customers because, you know, all of the, the referenceability, all of the um, kind of um, just marketability, all the, the uh, durability of your business is based on how successful can you make that core group. And if you're not committed to it from the get-go, it's just not gonna scale. So I always encourage them, over-invest early, apply extra resources, make those first five to 10 successful, then you have the benefit and potential the luxury of getting to 100, then maybe you get to 1,000. But if it's not part of the culture early, if you're not over-investing it, if the entire executive team isn't compensated in some way around customer success, then I think you're missing a big opportunity. Well, you bring up great points about culture. I mean, it, it has been pointed out by many great thinkers that all companies have a culture. It's just that some companies think thoughtfully about their mm -hmm. culture and really harness that culture toward productive ends. But specifically, to make it work, uh, there has to be some kind of leadership, there has to be some kind of governance, and there has to be, uh, and, and, uh, and compensation for the C-suite people. Everybody has to be vested in the success of, of their own customer success. But what about specifically the person who leads, whether it's they're titled the CSM or, or some, by some other title? Um, if a company take this seriously, who should that person report to? So w what we've seen is it really depends on the maturity of the company and the type of product they're selling. Um, early on, it typically you know, falls into the sales organization and they own the entire customer life cycle from you know, acquisition through retention. Um, as they kind of refine the processes and get things going, eventually it typically um, spawns its own independent group, uh, which you know, has direct you know, accountability up to the CEO. And so early on, it, it you know, again, typically fits in, in sales, but eventually it, it, it maps over somewhere else. Uh, we have some time for audience questions, so I'm going to go to that in just a bit. And, and um, I believe we have uh, mic runners, so if you uh, want to ask a question of any of the panelists on this topic, just get your hand up and we'll get a, uh, we'll get a mic to you. Um, w let's talk about the intersection. Uh, th this goes to what Gainsight and others are doing, but Talk about the intersection of big data and predictive analytics and the power of that to really transform this and make this revolution permanent because it's measurable and, and there can be clear return on investment attached to it. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, Nick said it well this morning. I think data is important, but I think it's really not the heart of what needs to happen here. And, and again, I'll go back to my Salesforce automation analogy. You know, just today, you know, in, in kind of this modern era, are you starting to see predictive analytics around, you know, Salesforce automation? Mm -hmm. and, but it's been valuable for 20 years, even before that. And I think the reason is, is it drives a set of process changes. Oh, okay. And so, to me, the workflow, the process change, the fact that you're operating in a coordinated way, and also the fact that the entire company on a cross-functional basis is now behind this because you have a, a set of a system and an approach that's unified uh, and I think that's absolutely critical. So I think data is important. I think big data is powerful. But I think a lot of the workflow aspects, to me, are the starting point to actually make this yeah. change. We happen. have a question over here. But before we get to them, I just had uh, I just had to wait, make one comment. Last week, I was privileged to interview on stage a fellow named Howard Bihar. Howard Bihar was the number two at Starbucks from 1989 to his retirement in 2003. And he was really the perfect complement for Howard Schultz. Howard Schultz, very driven guy, very numbers guy, doesn't score high on empathy. <laughs> uh, j just as Jeff Bezos probably doesn't score high on empathy, nor did Steve Jobs. But Howard Behar really built the culture, and we talked about data. How, you know, th there were a couple of points in their growth where they could sense that they were losing that magic in their stores, where their employees were becoming on the margin, just a little surlier, yep. where the customers were on the margin, just a little less happy. And, uh, and he had the sensitivity to see it. And I said, well, w did you have the data to support it? And he said, let me put it this way. Your wife tells you she's unhappy. Is that enough data for you? <laughs> uh, yes, number one. Uh, my question is for Roger mostly. Um, can you position yourself just in terms of understanding or making a statement around the um, the, the, the comment around the fact that you had, um, you 
recommend that your companies early invest and hire yep. chief customer officer or whatever the title may be early, um, but then stated that uh, that you would have them inside that, that general sales organization. Um, which approach have you found actually works and why? I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. And so my, my initial priority is to um, emphasize the importance and value of customer success and make sure that we have at least somebody in the organization that lives it, breathes it, sleeps it, um, and that they feel accountable for it. And so I want to make sure A, that happens. B, where do they fit in the organization? Early on, it typically sits in sales. And so it's less important to me where they fit. It, that's more of just a byproduct of the organization, how, they'll sh how they're structured. For me, the priority is to make sure they actually just have that person to begin kind of um, thinking about it, um, institutionalizing the activities and, and developing the culture around it. Uh, but I'd say it just happens, that usually in the early days they fall into sales and eventually that person, again, will, they'll either break out and create their own group or will head a, uh, or will hire a, a more senior person then to go run that group and that person will, will switch over. Question? Yeah. Um, I, I think I heard you say that your top companies had about 20% uh, or 120% net churn. And I, I noticed on the box S1, that their net churn number was 136%. So Box has this incredible sales and marketing I expense, but if they're getting an extra 30% incremental revenue, then maybe this land and expand strategy makes, makes sense. Uh, and that their sales and marketing, if it ends up that their customer growth can be that great. Uh, so, so do you have a, a thought? I mean, it seems like Box has a very high net churn number higher than what you had. had yeah, I, I won't, I won't, I don't want to talk about box per se, but I would say that the, um, the, the achievable rate of customer expansion is going to vary by industry, by initial price point. So I'm talking about a bunch of companies that sell big ticket SaaS enterprise to enterprises. If you're on, with a consumer product where you're starting at a low price point, you ought to reach for um, higher levels of customer expansion, although you're going to have higher levels of customer churn to deal with. So what's achievable will vary by, by segment. And, and in each segment, you want to be the best at what you do. And I would agree with you that on, on revenue expansion within the kind of <coughs> world that Box is in, I think they do a good job. So you can't yeah. spend more money on, on customer <coughs> acquisition if you have this big internal growth. You, yeah, you can. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, uh, so I, I agree with everything Harrison just said, and I, I won't comment on Box either, but look, all of the juice in this business comes from land and expand. And so if you are incapable of doing that, eventually you're going to hit some asymptote in your company and it's going to be very hard to continue scaling. You can get away with it for a little while because the churn won't catch up with the new customer acquisition, but eventually it becomes too much of a headwind on the company that you can't really sustain real growth. We had last year at the conference the, the CFO of Success Factors up here. I think the stat he gave was that their um, installed base you know, had roughly a 60% operating margin. And so this is a lot of the, 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 the economic you know, value of land and expand drove basically all of their profitability and all of the, the economic leverage in the business. And, and the so bummer about getting bigger is that profitability starts to be a, the conversation right. and this yeah. is the most profitable way to grow, no question. And, and if you're from Sacramento, asymptote means you've hit a flat spot. <laughs> so <laughs> next question. Hi, I'm Omid Razavi, customer success and growth at Success factors now has ah, right. So I've been exposed to both uh, business models. Um, in a survey by Technology Services Industry Association of the top enterprise SaaS companies, um, they revealed that none of the enterprise SaaS companies are profitable. And on the average, they spend $2 on sales and marketing for every dollar of incremental revenue. A question is from each of the uh, venture uh, participants, uh, in terms of at what point from your portfolio companies you expect them to show a line of sight to profitability? Um, I, I would I would just add to those say, but um, that's very much what's happening now. We've been in software for 30 years. We've been in SaaS for 15 years. What until a few weeks ago, what the public market buyers wanted was growth, growth, growth. I've got a fabulous SaaS business that grows at 30% operating margins, it grows 40% a year, and all the bankers said, you should lose money, what are you doing? So, but you sense the weather changing a bit on that right now in the public markets. So every business need, doesn't need to be profitable now, doesn't need to be profitable four years from now, but the unit economics need to start working early, 
and the more that public market investors start asking that question about profitability, the more uh, stroke that people in this room are going to have to have that conversation internally about why this investment is so important. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and we are coming to the end of our time, and I know there are some people with their hands up. But just to, to complete this thought, that uh, the market has rewarded growth at almost any cost up until it didn't uh, starting around March. And now, you know, you read any financial journal or even USA Today's business page for that matter, and you see headline after headline that the market is rotated to value. So as the market rotates yeah. to value, this kind of, having this kind of capability becomes for sure. goes straight to the market value of the company. The, the, the way it also answer that question is, the, we look at is, is a couple other ratios. Um, you know, it's your CAC, your acquisition cost, to the lifetime value. So it's not $2 for $1, you know, revenue today, but what does that revenue look like over 10 years if you're adding 20% per year compounded, you know, over 10 years? The $2 acquisition cost may yield you $12, $15, you know, $20 of revenue. So you have a five to one, eight to one, 10 to one ratio. So it does actually make sense to overinvest in sales and marketing if you have that much visibility into what the LTV looks like. And the second one is just the break even point. You know, does it take you six months, 12 months, you know, two years to break even? And you have to figure out where in that spectrum you, you know, as an organization are comfortable. Some companies would rather it be six months if they have a, you know, lower CAC to LTV ratio. Other companies are more comfortable, you know, having it be longer if they feel that they can hold on to that customer for five or 10 years or longer. So you know, but I think the key to all of this is, look, the capital markets are gonna change. They're sometimes they're gonna reward growth, sometimes they're gonna reward value. You know, sometimes it, capital's cheap, sometimes it's expensive. But I think the key is, how do you build a sustainable business? And the key to sustainability, where you can withstand bad times and take advantage of the good times, I think starts with all the concepts that you all have been talking about for the last day and a half, which is how do you have customers that love you, love your products, get value, grow the amount of business they do with you, uh, and as a result, your company grows. I think that's what it's all about, and I think companies that do that, they're gonna be around for a long time. Yeah, I'd say that's a perfect place to end the panel. That is absolutely true. It's certainly something I found in my book, The Soft Edge, which was really about the cultural values, and having deep and abiding respect and for customers and having customers trust you on a fundamental level is absolutely the key to be able to survive in bad economic times and good and uncertain economic times. And when the disruptive wave hits your industry, which it will sooner yeah. or later, to give you just a longer grace period to figure it out and get it right. Well, let's give our panelists a big hand. Thank you.